topic of wanting to revisit serpent seed. And next thing I know, last two weeks, I see you doing about three or four shows on serpent seed. So there's great interest in the topic now, which is awesome. You know, it's like people are catching up, so it's good. Yes, it's hard to believe, actually. Um, but I guess there's awakening in, in the right people of uh, right. Like we talked before. So yeah, um, absolutely. Even, you know, I've been doing a lot of shows with Rob Skiba, and he's got a huge following, and um, his listeners are interested as he is himself. And so uh, I've really been opening up a lot of information in this regard to them, and it's good to see that people are being receptive when there's been such vehement opposition, you know, and just straight-up hatred for this topic. Yeah, previously. absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's go ahead and get started because I, I want to maximize our time, if that's yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. But I love talking to you. I wish we just would fellowship just outside of these shows, too. But I know. Yeah, yeah, certainly. You're pretty busy there. but um, Yeah, I'm, I'm really just about every day doing shows and having conversations with people. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Busy. Well, Father God, thank you for bringing uh, Brother Zen and I together again. And hopefully this is one of a continuing series until you return as Jesus the Messiah. We look forward to that, Father. Thank you for all the blessings in our lives in many different ways. And uh, uh, we, we pray, Father, that you're with Zen and I tonight when two or more come together in your name. We know your promises are true. Zen, did you want to add to the prayer here? Uh, yes, Father, we just ask that you um, bless us in sharing discernment with the listening audience and that they open themselves a new possibility and that they come to inquisitive nature on these topics with open mind and without judgment and bias and really uh, receive things with new possibility. And in that way, uh, they can learn and move forward with new revelation and until, you know, some are willing to really have that open-mindedness. Uh, they remain stuck in their indoctrination. And unfortunately, um, that's where most of the world is with regard to mainstream churchianity. And so we just pray for discernment for everybody and that we teach it in the way that you would have us share it with the world. Yeah, let, let it be so. So be it. Very good. Yeah, I certainly agree. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Professor Truth, and it, I have my guest tonight, uh, Zen Garcia. Everybody knows Zen. <laughs> Zen uh, is a uh, global celebrity and, and also a, uh, a warrior of the Most High, and uh, it's an honor, Zen, for me uh, once again to, to fellowship with you this evening, and may Jesus, our King, lead us both into the direction, like you say, to open up new frontiers. Um, any introduction comments there, my friend? Um, other than if you are interested in my work, you can find uh, most of my books at sacredwordpublishing.com. Our video broadcasts and shows uh, air in archive on our YouTube channels, Zen Garcia and Endeavor Freedom. Okay, make sure you guys check those out. Zen has so many books. Um, I, yeah, I have a, I struggle to even write a single book, and Zen pops them out every every month or two. It seems so uh, well done, good and faithful servant there, Zen. So, what, what's your latest book? I think you uh, you and I discussed earlier in the week. Um, what I thought we would do tonight, Zen and ladies and gentlemen, is um, we want to talk a little bit about the serpent seed in Genesis four one. But I say a little because. Zen has so many shows on this, and he and I have covered it in the past, so we don't want to necessarily repeat. We just want to hit some key points, maybe embellish some of our new understandings, and then we want to move on. Zen, you said you had this new book about uh, the garments of Adam and Eve. I thought that sounded fa fascinating. Oh, yeah. The, the one that I'm working on currently is called The Garments of Power and the Rod of Wonder, and it has to do with two items that, it, according to um, some of the commentary in ancient manuscripts, like the Perk D. Rabbi Eleazar, 
uh, which Eliezer was a high priest during the first sec, uh, and second century BC when the Maccabean Wars took place and uh, the opposition against Rome and everything. And in fact, Maccabees 4 is about he and his family being um, persecuted and tortured by Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes uh, and being forced to try to eat uh, food sacrificed unto idols. But anyways, um, he mentions that this garment and this staff were made before even the foundations of this world and that they would have a special place uh, in assisting the direction, the fate, and um, the prophetic occurrence of so many of the patriarchs and prophets, and it would be passed down from Adam all the way to the return of Messiah in Second Advent. And so, um, fascinating history, uh, the storyline, and the different things that are connected to this uh, information is absolutely mind-blowing, and it's something that very few people know much about at all. And when you see the connections um, as I reveal it in this book, it's absolutely mind-blowing because it connects with the garments of power to Nimrod's uh, establishment of the New World Order, the building of the Tower of Babel, and also with um, the the robe of many colors for Joseph, and also the uh, robe dipped in blood that Messiah returns in, and also the rod of iron that he rules over the nations with during the Millennial Age. So a lot of connections and um, fascinating storyline once you understand it in discernment are you saying that this uh these garments uh from from father god uh, are the same as the the uh, ro uh robe of many colors as well as the uh jesus's own uh robe is that what you're saying yes it, the, it's all the same thing wow mm -hmm. and you're getting this from which texts uh, many different texts, actually. Um, you can find mention of it in the writings of Abraham, the Perkti Rabbi Eliezer, the Chronicles of Jeremiel, uh, the Legends of the Jews, in the Book of Jasher, and there's some ambiguous mention of it within the scriptures. Uh, also in the Aramaic Targum, which is the oldest translation of the Hebrew Torah, it's uh, the first translation of the, uh, the Hebrew Torah, the Pentateuch, into a different language, uh, Aramaic. And having the English translations of those Aramaic translations, there's so much more information available uh, on just about every verse and every passage in Scripture uh, with regard to the first five books of Moshe. And so... Uh, yeah, there's lots of mention of these garments and the you know the rod of wonder as well within the within these particular books that I made mention of. Now the rod of wonder was that Moses's rod or was that something different? Yes, it is. Um, the rod of wonder was actually uh, a limb from the tree of life. And when Adam was banished from paradise, he was given this staff and this staff was passed down, it says, um, to uh, from Adam to Enoch and then to Noah. And um, it was passed on in line to the different patriarchs, but it was stolen by Ham off of the ark. Uh, and then he gave it to Cush, and then Cush delivered him to Nimrod uh, when he uh, came of age. And then these items were used by Nimrod to uh, seize control, uh, establish the New World Order in that time, and to unite all the people and with the, the Tower of Babel and the building of it. And then Esau uh, killed him and took the garments from him and then when he sold his birthright he actually uh, traded to um, he had hidden these items and then traded uh, his birthright 
for what was the sword of Methuselah. Uh, and we see that in the scriptures it says that he would live by the sword. Well, what people don't understand is that this sword, uh, the sword of Methuselah, was imbued with special power as well. And that Esau used this to, you know, to conquer uh, the people in the areas around him. But uh, he had sold his birthright and also um, the inheritance of the cave of Machpelah, which is where Adam and Eve and also Abraham and Sarah, um, and eventually Isaac and Rachel and Jacob and uh, Rebecca, all of them were were buried in this particular cave and later it also Joseph was returned there um, and it, this Solomon even describes burying David there in some of these um, and so a lot of the ancient patriarchs are uh, buried in this cave of Machpelah but anyways um, he hid in somewhere in his place uh, residence and his mother uh, had discovered this Rebecca and then she delivered these items over to Jacob and so Jacob inherited the both the garments of power and the staff uh, of wonder the sapphire staff it was it had the name of yod heh vod -Heh, the name of the most high God imbued um, and written on it as well as the names of the it says the six male and four female patriarchs of Adam's line and then also the the ten plagues that would occur uh, to Egypt um, during Moshe's freeing and liberating them from their captivity and so um, when when Jacob he passed these on when he died and you'll see that in the story it's always that when the patriarchs are going to die they call forth all of their children and all of the 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 different patriarchs of the different bloodlines like in Jacob's instance the 12 tribes came forth and he delivered to Joseph these items and that was the coat of many colors as well as this um, staff of authority and then when Joseph ruled over uh, Egypt um, you know and he was imbued with power and given power by Pharaoh to uh, to rule during this time even though he was only second in command he actually enjoyed full power um, and ruled over Egypt just um, in you know in a in a secondary fashion, but anyways, um, and when he died, the the Egyptians went into his house and stole all of his items and placed them into the royal vault, and then uh, Ruel, who is also called Jethro, Ruel, the father-in-law of Moshe, he um, was an advisor for Pharaoh. Uh, one of the three advisors for Pharaoh during uh, the time after uh, after Joseph's passing. And so Job was also one of the advisors. And then Janus and Jambres, who were the two brothers of Balaam, I mean, the two sons of Balaam. And um, they advised Pharaoh because he uh, he and his the royal family they had a skin condition and so this is also the reason why uh, Pharaoh's daughter was down by the river when she saw Moshe in you know the basket and then um, adopted him and then his sister Miriam who was following the basket ran and got his mother Jochebed and she was hired to be the uh, the wet midwife. nurse yeah the midwife well he had already been delivered but the, the wet nurse for um for Moshe and so she actually got paid to raise her own son and um anyway so that was the reason why she was down there but um Janice and Jambres had told Pharaoh that he should bathe in the blood of young Hebrew boys, infants and youths. And so that's when he began to uh, slaughter these children and to bathe in their blood. And because of that judgment, Ruel, who um, 
you know, ended up being um, Moshe's father-in-law later, he left. He ran uh, and he took Joseph's um, garments and also this rod with him and went east towards the land of Midian. And Job, because he did not um, speak loudly in opposition to this particular declaration, uh, he you know, was from uh, the tribe of Esau, but still he was a Hebrew and um, he, he didn't speak out against it. And so that is in the storyline, the reason why he was allowed to go through um, what Satan had put him through with regard to his trial and why he had all of these boils uh, on his skin and, um, you know, had a similar condition as what Pharaoh had gone through because of his not objecting to the spilling of innocent blood. But Ruel uh, leaving he became a high priest for the people out in Midian and then he realized the, as Abram did, um, the futility of worshiping idols. And he became a believer in the Most High God. And um, he used to walk around with this staff, um, Joseph's staff, and the staff of wonder. And one day he leaned on it in the garden in near his house and it entered into the into the soil and then bloomed as a tree and so um he wasn't able to withdraw it from the from the soil and so but he realized that um one day the deliverer of what would be the hebrew people and the liberator of their bondage in Egypt would come because he understood the whole 430 year prophecy that the children of Abraham would be in bondage to the children of Ham in Egypt for a certain time. And when that bondage would end that, um, you know, there would be a person would come and regain uh, control of this staff. And that person ended up being Moshe. And so um, the story was that it, there were a lot of people that wanted Zipporah, who was his daughter, his eldest daughter, were asking for her hand in marriage. But he made it a stipulation that you would have to withdraw this staff from the ground as an indicator that you were worthy to uh, take her hand in marriage. And and because he was waiting for this, the prophetic coming of this individual. And this is also where we get the whole, you know, the whole prophecy of the, the sword of Arthur, uh, Excalibur, and removing it. Uh, it's similar uh, entail to what is the, the staff of wonder. And so um, Moshe he had witnessed, and a lot of people don't know this story as well, but he had witnessed one of the taskmasters abusing a certain Hebrew individual, and he lusted after his wife, and he forced this individual to go to work uh, and to leave and to not return home um, so that he could try to seduce his wife. Kind of, then, kind of sounds like uh, King David, right? Right, with uh, Bathsheba, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this story is kind of similar. But, uh, and, but he, you know, he didn't force, even though he did seduce Bathsheba, he didn't, this, this lady was raped. And the name of the individual, uh, Dathan, was the, the Hebrew um, individual that his wife was taken advantage of. And so Moshe realized this, that this taskmaster was doing this. And so when he actually raped um, Dathan's wife, that's when the Most High basically instructed him um, to take vengeance upon him for this particular Hebrew. And then when the it was known, it came to be known, uh, that's when he left because Pharaoh put, you know, basically a hit out on him. And so he went eastward to the land of Midian. Yeah, you're talking then, about Moses or Moshe, as you say it, right? Yeah, Moshe. That's the Hebrew name for Moses. Yeah. Um, and so 
Moses, he went eastward and came to the same well that um, that both Isaac and Jacob had met their wives, and um, and he also met his wife there, Zipporah, and he uh, he gave water to all of their animals and to all of the other flocks of the the other people that were because uh, the wells really sprung and the water came forward in great abundance for both um, Isaac, Jacob, and in this case, Moshe. So you're saying this well, Jacob and Isaac's well, is that the same as we call Jacob's well? Uh, It's called Miriam's well. Because I've been Um, to Jacob's well. Yeah, but it is the same thing. It's the one that Abraham had established and he and Lot you know, they um, they decided to split from this particular well. Yep. And then Laban and um, and and Jacob they made um, they made their pact. Uh, you know, as far as to with their animals, it was the same well. Okay. Uh, in the story, and so um, Moshe later met his wife Zipporah there at the same place, and so when he went. To um, he followed them. They were. He was invited back to Zipporah's house, and he was a guest of Jethro. Uh, but Jethro realized that he was running from Pharaoh, so he imprisoned him for a time, and he forgot about him. But Zipporah took care of him and kept feeding him. And then after a time, uh, when none of the suitors were able to pull forth the staff. Um, she reminded her father about Moshe and so Moshe was brought up out of the ground and then he immediately went to uh, the sapphire staff and pulled it out of the ground and then Jethro realized that he was you know he was the one that he had waited for and so he gave Zipporah over to Moshe for wife and then after that they he would graze the his animals near Mount Sinai, where the burning bush was, and he and his wife were out there with the flocks one day when it was cold and it was raining and they couldn't start a fire and Moshe saw the burning bush and so he went to investigate and that's when he met uh, Yahweh in in on the mountain there and that's when he was appointed. Um, and he was shown also the, you know, the God instructed him and showed him how the staff would turn into a serpent, uh, gave him the ability to uh, remove the leprosy from his hand, what seemed like leprosy, and then send him in task to go free uh, the Hebrews from the bond, their bondage in Egypt. And because... Now, this Moshe, was uh, the, the voice in the burning bush telling you Yes, this was, yeah. Um, I am that I am. Um, and so, because Moshe had, when he was younger, he had burned his mouth and his lips with a hot coal. Uh, that's why he said that, you know, he wasn't eloquent oh, okay. of tongue. And so anyways, um, that's that's when Aaron was appointed and Aaron was sent a dream that his brother was returning and that together they were going to liberate the the Hebrew people. And so they used the staff, uh, this particular staff, to, you know, it, it would turn into a serpent and ate all the other serpents of um of the magicians, Janus and Jambres and the others that were serving Pharaoh. But another thing that is mentioned in the, in the story, and that's not spoken about in greater detail, like in the King James or many of the other texts, is that um, Pharaoh had trained um, animals like lions and uh, bears to protect the halls and to protect the different portions of the palace and they would attack um, you know any visitors but uh, Moshe and Aaron would use the staff to make them docile and these animals would become um, 
you know, docile and friendly and would even lick their feet. And they were able to walk right into the palace um, and to confront Pharaoh and, you know, to demand that the, the people be released. And, you know, the, of course, the Ten Plagues and all that, which was already written on the this Staff of Wonder, all of that would come to being. But um, just to quickly go through some of the other stories that are related to this, it's the same staff that Moses used to split the Reed Sea and to cause the ground to dry so that they could go forth and cross it safely. And then when he lowered the staff, it came crashing down on Pharaoh and his armies. And this was a, a reap what you sow type of judgment because, you know, um, they had killed the Hebrew boys. Uh, the, they had the Egyptian midwives overseeing the births of the Hebrew children. They would toss all of the boys into the Nile River and it would empty out into this portion um, called the Reed Sea, uh, which was, you know, where the Nile River emptied out into this Reed Sea. And that's also where they crossed over. It's not the Red Sea, it's the Reed Sea. And so, anyways, um, that's where all of the Hebrew boys and their bodies would end up. And so that was the same place that Pharaoh and his armies met their, you know, their demise for having uh, done this kind of abomination to the generations of the Hebrew children for a very long time. And so they absolutely did reap what they sowed. And, um, and so afterwards, when they went into the promised land and met the Amalekites, which were the giants of Canaan living in the, the promised land, and that this land, which had been uh, promised to Abraham, had already been given over to Shem uh, after the division of the land by the brothers Ham, Japheth, and, and Shem. Shem was actually allotted the land of Canaan um, by his father Noah. But this land was usurped by the Canaanites, who were the children of Ham from you know ham having seen the nakedness of his father uh which it actually means that he had sexual relations with his mother and his the mother of uh, his mother and the second wife of noah at that time was nama the sister of tubal cain who was of the line of cain the seed of the serpent and so and well, wait, Ham, Ham didn't have relations with the, 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 the woman of Cain. She had it with the mother, right? Yeah, she had it with his mother, uh, who was Nama. Oh, the and mother Nama, was Nama. Okay, got it. Yeah, the mother was Nama. Yeah, and Nama when we, when we talked wife. last time, I, I checked on that, and you are correct, because um, I thought Nama was not of Cain, but I checked on that, and you, you are certainly correct on that. Yeah, her her name means pleasantness, but yeah, she was of the line of Cain, even though she was uh, a really gentle and kind person. And if you read in the writings of Abraham, it tells the whole story of how uh, Noah went to his father Lamech and asked him because he was instructing him to take Nama as wife. And the Most High God did indeed tell both Nama and Lamech that he wanted to preserve the seed that came through the flood uh, by having Noah take her as wife and it, he had already through his first wife birth Japheth and Shem and they followed in the ways and they were indoctrinated into what was the order of the ancients and uh, which was um, basically, basically called the church of the firstborn and Adam was instructed even before he left paradise in the ways of the order of the ancients. Uh, there's actually a manuscript written by Elijah which talks about the details of the beliefs of this particular order. Um, we have it published with the writings of Abraham. Uh, and you can find that at sacredwordpublishing.com. But anyways, and so he did take Nama uh, for his second wife and 
through her, Ham was born. And so Ham was, because she was 50%, you know, she was full-blooded, that made Ham 50% uh, serpent seed and then so when he slept with his mother who was also full-blooded serpent seed then his bloodline became predominantly uh, serpent seed you know the seed of the serpent and so Satan seed, uh, yep. yeah and so the canaanites who canaan was the result of his having seen the nakedness of his father uh, he was born from that fornication and that's why um noah he, he cursed was cursed him. yeah yep. yeah to be a servant um in the, you know the, uh, under and it was later during the time of joshua that uh, that tribe that acted like they were from a faraway place and they tricked Joshua and the princes of Israel to make a pact with them uh, and they made them servants to the scribes that they later usurped the Levitical priesthood and they became the Pharisees that conspired the murder of uh, Yehushua during the time that he was here in, in the flesh. Run, run that so, by me again. That were the Pharisees Usurp, yeah, where'd Joshua, they come from? Joshua chapter 9. You okay. read the story of a tribe of the, you know, of these particular, um, the Kenites. They act like they're from a faraway place. And they make a pact with um, Joshua to be servants unto him if they if he would just spare their lives and so he decided not to kill them and he makes the princes of Israel promise not to kill them as well and so uh, and because they didn't um, they didn't go to God in prayer before doing this they end up making them um, servants to the Levitical scribe the, uh, the scribes and um, you know the Lev Levi priesthood they become the, the wood gatherers and uh, those that assist uh, the scribes and the, the priesthood during this particular time and then later they were the ones that usurped the Levitical priesthood and became the Pharisees um, interesting that, yeah. yeah that took over control um, you know and that basically they became the, the rabbinical the Jewish rabbis that uh, conspired the murder of Christ and that denied him as Savior Messiah and so anyways uh, just going back to the, the story of the, the staff and the, uh, the rod of wonder um, it was in the war against the Amalekites that Moshe had to raise the staff and as long as he held the staff they had the tide of favor during the war against the Amalekites and the giants that were in opposition to them. Okay, and, I remember that. I just didn't know that he had that staff because I remember they said he, had, as long as he kept his arms up. But he right, his arms up. Yeah, it was that staff. Um, and then this was also the staff that he used to tap the rock and to bring forth the water. Um, in the desert when the Israelites were parched and dehydrating and uh, dying of thirst. And so, and then this staff later was passed down and handed off to uh, the different tribes. There's mention of it as being passed on from David to Solomon and to some of the other kings, uh, even making it to Josiah. Um, uh, but you know, it gets lost until there's one story of during the time of the apostles that Christ gives it to Matthew in order for him to be able to convert this group of cannibals um, in, in a story of the Acts of Matthias and Andrew, which is available in our Great Commission books. Um, it tells the story of the city of the man eaters which is a, a stronghold of Satan during the time that the apostles are given the great commission to go forward and to, to teach the gospel to all the different peoples of the world. And there was this group, this city, that any traveler that came to their town they would gouge out their eyes and then they would put them into prison and they would fatten them up like cattle. And then after a certain time, they would slaughter these people. 
um, and this particular town it also had association with you know like the the Sodom and Gomorrah and the five cities that were in the plains of Shinar that um, they were really doing really perverse things like the travelers that would come through town they would uh, gang rape them whether they were male or female they would allow anybody in the community to basically uh, enjoy sexual pleasure with them in any manner that they did and then they would not uh, it was a it was an ordinance that they could not provide food water or lodging to any of these individuals and that's they would die of starvation in these particular towns and this is why when lot um, took in the two angels and then you know the whole community came forward and demanded sexual relationships with these angels that he was really putting his life at risk and that's why he offered you know his daughters his virgin daughters to them um, it, should they just leave the angels alone but we know that the angels took judgment and brought justice to those towns and that they were destroyed in fire and brimstone but anyway so the final story that I've discovered with the ra, uh, with the the staff the rod of wonder besides that it will have connection to uh, Messiah when he returns that he will he will be um, clothed in this robe dipped in blood, which, you know, the robe dipped in blood is associated to the story of the the robe of many colors that uh, Joseph wore and that when they faked his death, they slaughtered a kid and dipped it, the robe in that blood. And so that's what, you know, it's being connected to in that particular story just most people don't understand the connections all the way back to joseph uh with this particular robe and so yeshua will be clothed in this garments of power the uh the robe of many colors when he returns and then it speaks about him having this uh, i'm kind of losing the connection between a robe now fr from a staff no no the, they're two the two different items but they okay they're they were um given to adam when he was cast out of paradise and both the garments of power and the staff of wonders they were passed down together uh, almost like icons of kingship okay got it and they were given from the various patriarchs to their different children and so in the story of christ returning he will have possession of both it says that he will be clothed in the robe dipped in blood as well that he will have an iron rod by which to rule over all the nations and so these two items are the Okay, sure. And so <clears throat> I was talking about how the garments of power and also the rod of wonder that were given to Adam when he was cast out of paradise, <clears throat> they're connected to the, uh, the robe dipped in blood that Yeshua would be wearing when he returns. Um, as you know Savior Messiah and Second Advent and so the rod of iron which he rules over the nations with during the millennial kingdom they are these two items and so there's a continuation <clears throat> and these two items so, were so the rod is the one that I'm going to ask you a question on in a minute that you claimed came from the tree of life originally and it passed down through all these kings that's the same rod you're talking about I believe and then yes. the robe that di is dipped in blood that was I understand it's separate and distinct but that also originated about the same time and was passed down yes it was um, it was the original clothing that um, that the Most High God had made for Adam when he okay those are the garments yeah that I saw yeah in your, the in garments of power yep and they were the um, the robe of many colors that were given to Joseph uh, by his father Jacob okay yeah I and so it's all the all the same thing and the storyline 
you know, follows him from the fall of humanity from paradise to the redemption and also to the second advent and the harvest at the end of days, which will separate the the wheat and the tares and the goat and the sheep. And so, and I sent you the prophecy of the ten kings. Oh, is that what I was reading? Okay, because it mentioned yeah, the garden. earlier. Um, and the prophecy of the ten kings makes mention of uh, the the different kings that would come to power. And you'll notice that in reading the story, it's almost like a back and forth narrative, as you see depicted in the the Dead Sea Scrolls, the wars of the sons of light against the sons of darkness, and how there would be these seven phases where uh, back and forth the children of Adam and then the children of Cain at different times would hold power and authority over each other and it would sway back and forth until the end of days and um you, the, you and i had talked on that in the past did you ever yes. find out which specific because i sent you some books but they were the wrong ones the war yeah the book of the wars of the lord which there's commentary about those particular um those manuscripts but they're not mentioned in fullness to where you can read them you know line by line and i've not been able to find those particular manuscripts anywhere even though you know at least we have commentary on them but i'd love to have um just a straight translation where i can read them third all the way from beginning to end myself but and you're saying they're called the wars of the lords the book of the wars of the lord uh um, those are part of some of the lost texts that are mentioned in the bible there's 23 manuscripts mentioned in the bible like with the jasher the book of jasher um like do you, do you know where the wars of the lords are mentioned Seth? I believe it's in Second Chronicles. Okay. The reason I ask, because maybe a little bit later, um, since we spoke last time or before that um, and talked about the seven wars, and you know how the seventh is a tiebreaker and the Messiah comes yes. to break the tiebreaker. Right. Um, I've discovered a whole new way of looking at the scriptures, which happens to align with seven cycles of evil prevailing for a while and good prevailing for a while. Uh -huh. I'll be happy to go into that a little bit later. Yeah, that's that's exactly what uh, the wars of the sons of light and the sons of darkness, and then the prophecy of the ten kings that I just sent you, um, because again, um, it ends with Yeshua coming in second advent, and then the father is the the final king that you know when the new Jerusalem descends out of the heavens and it speaks about how the the father and the son will reign with us here during that time um, that you know that prophecy of the ten kings is fulfilled in that manner so yeah it's all the same thing yeah that that's fascinating um, so this is in a, your new book and do you know what you're going to call that yeah it's called the the garments of power and the rod of wonder okay and that will be finished before your great contest series three then right yeah because <laughs> okay. um, yeah well that one's mostly written um because i sent you the manuscript on it too i just need to oh, really did? kind of yeah i did i sent you the word document for have it to go look for that okay. yeah so yeah just check your um your files um, but yeah i did um send you that one and it's mostly written i mean there's already I think like 15, 16 chapters. Uh, so it's already a full book. I just have to find the time to proofread it. And there's some additional material I want to add to it. Um, and then I'll release it. But Maybe you know, I'll proofread uh, it for you. Yeah, that, that would be it. good. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, and, I, you know, I was just, this particular topic became so interesting to me. Oh, I found it. Uh, Is it called Book Three, Sons of Anak? Yeah, the Sons of Anak, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. I didn't mm -hmm. see this. Yeah, no worries. Uh, and so I, that's why, and because nobody else anywhere has the information that I have. Okay, well, um, we were talking about your, your new book. Kind of, You went through the summary of it, and it uh, sounds absolutely amazing. Your, your grasp, then, of 
knowledge and information uh, continues to uh, amaze me. Uh, you, you've progressed significantly from an already high position of last time we spoke. Um, your command of of these books and how you just speak shows your your practice of doing this so so often, as well as your just hard work and diligence in uh, in this type of uh, wisdom. And I'm, I'm, I want to commend you for that. Oh well, thank you, brother. I I appreciate that. Um, you know, I'm just I love studying the ancient manuscripts, and I want to know more about the Bible and the Word of God and and to be able to share that with others because I I know that most just simply don't have the time to read all of this material and neither do they even know that it exists but uh, because I'm familiar with them and we also publish them to make them available for public consideration and I've spent you know, years and years and years reading them and rereading them and studying them in great depth uh, for the you know the different things that uh, have interested in me uh, with the different concepts I've written about. Um, as I was ma uh, mentioning before we went, you know, we got separated in the last um, break. Um, anyways, this is a and the reason I. Um, moved from the the Great Contest Three into this book and wanted to publish it and and to re release it is because I know that not a lot of people have ever heard about this particular story, and yet it's so interesting in the way that it unites, um, you know, the the history of all of the patriarchs of Israel, the the chosen seed, the the promised seed um, and you know to Messiah uh, which was something that I also wrote about in in my last book the ancient prophecies of Christ which reveals how without a doubt um, scripturally uh, Christ fulfilled not only the Old Testament prophecies about his coming but also many extra biblical books that have Prophecies that spoke about uh, his coming at a certain time and uh, in certain place, and all these things were fulfilled in the same manner. And so, I wanted to piece together this story as well and to make it available because I know this is something that, uh, because most people don't read and study the extra biblical text, they would never be able to piece together this story in the manner that I've been able to. Um, you know, in the context of this book. And so I think people will be fascinated by it and uh, it will also give them exposure to a lot of the various ancient collections which they don't even know that exists and uh, will intrigue them to, to read them and to consider them for themselves. Well, I definitely want to get a hold of, of that one. You say it's the ancient prophecies of Christ. Yeah, the ancient prophecies of Christ. It's um has a lot of information uh, about the coming of Christ and the prophecies that he fulfilled. Like, um, for instance, one of the <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that my son is working on currently right now. He's putting a book out called "In the Beginning Was the Word" and what he's doing for this particular book and it's part of what I did in the ancient prophecies of Christ we reveal how in the Aramaic Targum which again is the oldest translation of the Hebrew Torah into a different language Targum just means translation uh, it's even older than the Greek Septuagint by 200 years and dates back to the diaspora of Nebuchadnezzar's day when he took the the Israelites into exile in Babylon. Which, which Targum is that? The Aramaic and Palestinian Targum. Okay, those are the ones that maybe in a little bit that we're going to talk about Genesis 4-1, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Because again, um, it's not just with the serpent seed, but really every chapter and every verse 
uh, there's so much more information that has been lost in translation and excluded from the contemporary renditions of the Bible that if people would just read the Targum, they would learn so much more and gain so much more insight in to what the the scriptures should be revealing and so um anyway so what i was making mention of with the prophecies of christ is that my son's working on a book about how the word of the lord in the aramaic targum and also the targum of psalms and the targum of isaiah how the context and the the actual quoting and the um the translation of the word of the Lord, it's found in the five books of Moses, the first five books, the Pentateuch, over 217 times. It makes mention of the word of the Lord, which we know that Christ is the Logos, the Memra, uh, the word of the Lord mentioned in scripture. And in the modern King James version of the Bible, when you look up and seek, uh, the word of the Lord is only mentioned 11 times in those five books. And so over 200 times, the translation.